Well, a very warm welcome to Cumber Free Presbyterian Church for our services of today. We're glad to see you all, both upstairs and down, young and old alike, and we trust the Lord will richly bless you have joined with us for our worship services. And also to those that are meeting with us online, whether it's YouTube, uh, Sermon Audio, or Facebook, whatever social media platform you're tuning in from, we want to warmly welcome you in our Saviour's name. Thank you for joining with us, and we trust that you will be blessed today as you worship and as you hear the word of the Lord. We're turning to the hymn number six. We're going to stand together as we worship the hymn number six, Praise My Soul, the King of Heaven. Let's just take a few moments and we'll seek the Lord's face in prayer. We'll ask help of God in the services through today. Loving Father, we thank thee again for a sense of the divine presence. We thank thee, Lord, for the sentiments of these hymns that we will be singing today. We praise thee, Lord, as the hymn writer exhorted us to praise thee. We think even of the call to holy angels to join in that anthem of adoration and praise to God. We realize, Lord, the passion and the vision and the energy that was exerted even to write a hymn like this, to cause the church to praise him as though it's commanding us, Lord, and demanding of us, uh, Lord, that excellent spirit of praise. And we pray, Lord, that today it'll not be lost among the people of God. We pray, Lord, even in a world of chaos and confusion, a disappointment, Lord, and despondency, a world, O oh God, that's given over uh, to desecration of thy day, Lord, and sinning and rebelling against God. We pray, Lord, as a church, as a people, as individuals, that we will praise thee, that we will focus our attention upon the great King of heaven. 
and that we will worship thee in the beauty of holiness, that we will worship thee, O God, in spirit and in truth, and we'll know what it is to have the nearer presence of God, the infilling of the Spirit that will bring the presence of Christ to a gathering like this. Prepare our hearts, Lord, from the youngest child to the oldest individual. Lord, prepare each heart today for worship, and grant, Lord, that we may sing thy praise today, that we may acknowledge thee in all of thy goodness and grace and mercy and love, and thy compassion and benevolence to each one of us and remembering also thy righteousness and thy justice and thy holiness and purity that we will have compassion upon the lost who have to meet thee one day and sadly Lord some of them Lord if they were to meet thee now they're still in their sin they're out of Christ without a saviour they're lost they're perishing and Lord we realize that our God is a consuming fire and they have nothing O God for protection they cannot hide behind themselves or their own righteousness or goodness. They cannot hide behind an institution or an organization or a church. They cannot, Lord, hide behind the rites and rituals of any denomination. They cannot hide behind, O God, the church itself. We realize that Christ is the mediator. He's the covering for our sin. He is our hiding place. He's our ark of safety. We realize that he is our rock of defense. So we cry unto thee that sinners this day, our Father, in this meeting house and further afield, those who, O God, hear the word today, may possibly respond to it. We pray, Lord, that they will realize that the blood of Jesus Christ, his Son, cleanses us from all sin. And that blood, O oh God, can wash away a lifetime of sin. And there's no sinner too far away. And there's no sin too bad. But the precious blood of Jesus Christ can atone for and can pardon and forgive and Lord you can receive that sinner today on the ground of the finished work and shed blood of the Lamb and we pray O oh God for an awakening and for an arresting of the soul of the sinner on its downward course to hell lest that soul perish we passed the graveyards yesterday as we were out and about in visitation and Lord we reflected upon how many in the graveyards hundreds of them there and their destinies are sealed they cannot change it now oh some of them would wait for another moment on earth to change their destiny but they can't it's forever settled we thought about that yesterday it hit us oh God it, it motivated us we realize oh God that many of our friends and family many oh God that we know and love neighbors and others Lord people that people work with and go to school with and they're out of Christ without a savior and Lord those graveyards are filling up and Lord, if we were to go round and, and even look in the gravestone and see how many are saved, or even if we knew how many were lost, Lord, it would motivate us to evangelize and to move and to preach the gospel and to go against people who even oppose themselves, Lord, and, and not to listen to those who tell us not to preach or try to confine our evangelism. God, grant that we will see the value of the soul and that we must do everything within our power, I and beyond that, and even, Lord, go even against the wishes of others that we might bring the gospel to them because we love their soul and hell's a real place. It burns as we speak and there are countless thousands of souls from we commence this service at half past eleven. Lord, right till this very moment there are thousands of souls who have plunged out into eternity and thousands if not millions have already plummeted into hell and we cry unto thee that we will have feet to go, that we will have a heart to reach out, we have a hand to help and we pray, Lord, we'll have a love that's deep and strong and that will persevere. And no matter the difficulty, we will seek to win the lost for Christ and see souls brought to know him, whom to know is life eternal. So bless us as a church body and all that we seek to do. God grant that you will forward the work, that you will give vision to the people and grant, O oh God, there'll be a response in the heart to service. And as there's a call to duty and a call to service today, we pray, Lord, there'll be that, Lord, response that lives will be laid on the altar today, that souls will be consecrated to Christ and that they will, as David said, answer the question, who then is willing to consecrate his service this day unto the Lord? We pray, O oh God, there'll be those who will step out on the promise and they will 
say it's Christ for me and they will yield themselves as living sacrifices well pleasing unto thee and we pray you'll bless the congregation bless our denomination and many outside of it and the preaching of thy word today grant that thy presence will be here that the congregations O God of the Lord uh, would know the nearer presence of Christ the spirit of God working and the presence of the Lord in the midst bless the preaching of the word uh, both to the young and old we pray O God for the Sunday schools for the Bible classes we pray Lord for boys and girls who uh, do come to Sunday school when we think of so many thousands uh, in this Lord, uh, North Down area, we pray, O oh God, that you'll have mercy upon them. We think of the events in Newton Ards today when, uh, Lord, hundreds of young boys and, and girls are kicking football, Lord, and having competitions, and uh, very few of them go to Sunday school. We cry unto thee that you'll give us the next generation, and that you'll step in and help us to take these treasures of darkness, Lord, and grant, O oh God, you will enable us to see, O oh God, the next generation evangelized and won for Christ. We pray that we'll have big problems in the church that we don't have enough Sunday school teachers that we don't have enough youth leaders and that we're struggling oh God because so many are coming Lord give us problems like that in the church and Lord we pray you'll overrule our unbelief and in these days of declension and departure Lord it doesn't have to be so we cry unto thee for mercy we cry unto thee for an intervention of God among the young and we pray for the rescuing of children we pray Lord you'll put it on the hearts of parents Lord it's a tragedy that the parents are willing to go to hell themselves and they want to drag their children with them Lord what a wicked thing it is and we cry against it Lord it's of the devil it's fleshly and worldly and Lord it's contrary to the purpose of God and creation and we cry unto thee that they'll see the value of the soul that they'll realize that they never will die they'll live forever either in God's heaven or God's hell Lord we pray for a rescuing of souls in these days that are short for time is soon up Lord the second coming of Christ is near and we realize we need to be up and doing while it's day the night cometh and no man can work and we pray Lord you'll hear prayer today and bless the witness of the church and grant O God you revive thy work in these days and pour out of thy spirit upon us and we're not unmindful of individuals who need our prayers today and we do bring them before thee and pray for them we think of our brother uh, John Hamilton we pray Lord you'll remember John and Gemma and the family Lord remember John especially Lord you know all about him what he has gone through been through and what he's suffering at present and we pray Lord for uh, an ease and a bird an unburdening Lord we pray Lord for rest Lord we pray for healing we pray for that continual grace Lord it's got to get him down Lord it's got to Lord dis cause the spirit it, Lord to be depressed we pray Lord you'll just touch him today Lord and just encourage him and strengthen his hand Lord and the family and undertake for them in a very real and special way we pray for Brian today and for Pat and for Ruth Lord remember them especially remember Stephen Brown today as well an ongoing need there for James Devlin Lord the list goes on we think of Ken Brown today and John and Martha Ferguson Lord we pray Lord for thy hand upon John and Nell Kerr we pray for Billy and Muriel Potter today Lord the dear friends Lord of the congregation and Lord at home unable to get out we pray for them today and remember Lord Bobby Moore and Bobby Gibson Lord we pray for uh, our sister Frances Hunsdale in hospital and for Suzanne and the family we commend them to thee Lord we pray for our sister Janice Cook as well hasn't been well undertake for her remember Rita today Rita Peacock Lord we commend her to thee and we ask too Lord for uh, Lord Jason, whom Barbara Klaus has asked us to pray for, that you'll save this young fellow, Lord, and many in our families. Remember Eleanor today and Aileen, Lord. We commend them lovingly to thee. We think of Edith Finnegan, Lord. We pray for Raymond Stevenson. Lord, we pray for Jeff Wallace. So many on the list we've been asked to pray for. And we think of our ministerial brethren that are not well. We think of the Reverend Jim Harton, the Reverend William Whiteside, and the Reverend William Beatty. We pray for Dr. Lindsay Wilson, Lord, and the Reverend Fitzsimons, and many others on the list. We cry to thee for them. Remember Heather and Hard Capper and Lord remember Hartford and Phyllis Arnold today. We cry to thee Lord for the Crawford family. You know all about them Lord. We commend them lovingly to God. We pray for our sister Yvonne Spence today Lord. We think of our sister Diane Ernie and Bran and the family and we commend them to thee. We think too of our sister Betty Allister as she prepares for the operation. Lord will you remember Betty and would you be pleased to undertake for all and every need she has. We think of our sister Mar Margaret McGee as she laid her 
dear sister Anna to rest there on Thursday. We commend Lord Margaret to God and we pray for her. We pray for Jean and for Norris today. Lord, you know all about them. We think, Lord, too, of Owen McCarthy and Gladys. Lord, we just cry to thee that you'll step in there and you'll undertake. Remember, too, Lord, the church in Ukraine and, and Russia and the need there. We pray, Lord, for the Consider Christ campaign yesterday down in County Cavan and for the thousands of homes that were visited with gospel literature. We thank thee for this outreach, Lord, and we pray that you will use the literature to speak to hearts that many souls will be brought to know Christ as their own and personal Saviour. And then for our family night tonight, for Alfie and for Ruth as they come uh, to testify and minister in song, for the fellowship here in the house, the light refreshments afterward, we pray, Lord, that you'll encourage us and you'll show us mercy. And Lord, while in others thou art calling, do not pass us by. Remember us here in Cumber and continue thy good hand upon us as we commit and commend the work to thee and put it into thy hand now. Do bless and encourage and do undertake for us. And Father, in answer now to prayer, be pleased to glorify thy dear Son. We ask these things in his precious and most worthy name. Amen. And amen. Let's turn in our Bibles, please, to Luke's Gospel, chapter 17. Luke chapter 17, please. And we'll commence to read at the very first verse. Luke chapter 17 and the verse 1. Let us all hear and read the word of the Lord together. Then said Jesus unto the disciples, It is impossible, but that offenses will come. But woe unto him through whom they come. It were better for him that a millstone were hanged about his neck, and he cast into the sea, than that he should offend one of these little ones. Take heed to yourselves. If thy brother trespass against thee, rebuke him. And if he repent, forgive him. And if he trespass against thee seven times in a day, and seven times in a day turn again to thee, saying, I repent, thou shalt forgive him. And the apostles said unto the Lord, Increase our faith. And the Lord said, If ye had faith as a grain of mustard seed, ye might say unto this sycamore tree or sycamore tree, Be thou plucked up by the root, and be thou planted in the sea, and it should obey you. But which of you? having a servant ploughing or feeding cattle, will say unto him by and by, when he has come from the field, go and sit down to meet, and will not rather say unto him, make ready wherewith I may sup, and gird thyself and serve me, till I have eaten and drunken, and afterward thou shalt eat and drink. Doth he thank that servant because he did the things that were commanded him? I try not or I think not. So likewise ye, when ye shall have done all those things which are commanded you, say, We are unprofitable servants. We have done that which was our duty to do. Amen. We'll end our reading there at the verse 10. The Lord will indeed bless the public reading of his own precious and infallible word. we we'll ask our clerk of session, Mr. Jackie Allister, please, if he'll come forward. He's going to make some necessary announcements. Thank you. Well, we do want to welcome you afresh uh, out to the house of God today. It is good to see you out uh, this lovely Sunday morning. We do pray that the Lord will bless each one of you in his presence today. I do remember, of course, that uh, we're meeting around the Lord's table uh, at the conclusion of this service this morning. And, of course, that table is for all those who know the Lord and are seeking to walk with him. We do invite and encourage you to remain with us around the Lord's table this morning. Then do remember our special uh, meeting in the evening time, our gospel meeting, uh, when Mr. Alfie Stewart will be along to bring a word of testimony. Uh, and of course, uh, the, Mrs. Ruth Carson uh, will be here to minister in song. And of course, afterwards, do remember, uh, there will be some refreshments served over in the church hall. So it would be 
keep that in mind. Uh, our prayer meeting on Tuesday evening, uh, it will be a deputation uh, meeting for Miss Noreen McAfee, uh, who of course uh, serves the Lord out in Uganda. So do keep that in mind. Our sister Noreen will be along on Tuesday evening. Uh, then on Friday at 10 p.m., our men's prayer meeting as normal. Next Lord's Day, our Sunday School and Bible class continues at quarter past 10. Uh, the two services, half past 11 and 7 p.m. Uh, the speaker next Lord's Day will be Mr. David McCauley. He's a, a student in the Whitfield College of the Bible. He'll be along for both services. And of course, do remember as well uh, the seasons of prayer uh, before those meetings. Uh, next Lord's Day will be the 1st of May. Uh, that marks the opening of our open air uh, witness for the summer season. Uh, and next Lord's Day, God willing and the weather permitting, uh, the open air will be uh, down in Railway Street at 3 p.m. So do keep that uh, in mind. Uh, can I mention again uh, the meeting for communicant members on Tuesday the 3rd of May, uh, just after uh, the prayer meeting. Then can I mention there is this uh, little card there in the hall of the church. Uh, it is a series of missionary-based meetings. I think it's organized by our mission board, but the venue is our Lisburn congregation, Lisburn Free Presbyterian Church, uh, and there are details there of the different it starts. Commences on Saturday the 7th of May. It runs right through, I think, until the next Saturday, the 14th of May. Uh, different subjects and different speakers each evening. So do take one of those cards with you uh, and uh, you can see all the details there. Thank you. Thank you we do thank our clerk of session for those announcements, subject as always to the divine will of the Lord. Uh, my wife and I will be taking a week's holiday starting tomorrow. Uh, we'll not be out of the country, we'll be out and about. And uh, if there are any emergency calls or any funerals or anything like that, we are available. You could contact one of the elders and they'll contact me. And I uh, trust that the Lord will <clears throat> bless you in our absence and encourage you. And uh, we trust the Lord will encourage those who come to preach, especially our brother David next Lord's Day, as he preaches the word of the Lord. 512 this time before we come to the preaching of the word. 512, give me the faith which can remove and sink the mountain to up the end.
praise the Lord. It's hard to believe that hymns like that have been preserved over the years, and we're still able to sing them today. Charles Wesley's great hymn, Give Me the Faith That Can Remove and Sink the Mountain to a Plain. Give me the childlike praying love that longs to build thy house again. I was reading over that hymn, looking over the sentiments of other hymns, and they certainly have blessed and touched my own heart. And we pray the Lord will bless you today and challenge your heart as we think of Christian service and duty in these very difficult days. Luke chapter 17, and we'll seek the Lord's face before we come to the preaching of the Word of God. Our gracious and our eternal loving Father, it is with thanksgiving that we come afresh and once again into thy presence. We're in no hurry today. We're not rushing in and rushing out. We realize, O oh God, we're not going to hinder the Spirit of God. We're not going to grieve the Lord. We're not going to just give a little moment to thee and then give our hearts, Lord, uh, 23 hours of the day to the world. We realize, O oh God, that this heart is thine, this body is thine, that has redeemed us, saved us by thy grace, that has the glorious, wondrous purpose for us. And Lord, we need to find thy will, we need to obey that will. There is the revealed will, that which is commanded in scripture, which is clearly taught, which we must obey and walk in. And there is the concealed will, which is never revealed until we're obeying the revealed will of God. And we ask, Lord, that even now as we come to contemplate the word, as we come to this portion of Holy Scripture, to the words that Christ spoke to his disciples, grant, O God, that we will have instruction and counsel from the mouth of the Lord today, that we will have the experience of the disciples, we will have the Lord communicate the word right to our hearts, that Christ would speak with us as individuals just as it was said lord that you, you spoke to thy disciples and you said these words to them so we thy followers thy disciples lord speak that word to us individually may it be as if we're sitting at thy feet lord as if we're standing around or sitting around in a semicircle just with the lord that at the center hearing his word taking in drinking in milking in oh god that which you're giving out to us lord take away every distraction every one thought. There's got to be things pressing on our minds. There's got to be things depressing the spirit. There's got to be things touching the heartstrings. Oh God, we pray that you will grant that we will be released from those things, that we will be delivered from those things now, and we will have our focus and our mind's attention and our heart's desire upon the word of the Lord. Grant that this word today will be profitable, being mixed with faith in them that hear it. We pray, Lord, it'll not be a word for someone else. It'll be a word for me. And to this end, we're like Samuel, Lord, exhorted by Eli the high priest speak Lord for thy servant heareth speak to hearts today saved and unsaved alike and grant O God while the table may be primarily spread for the people of God that crumbs falling from the master's table would be sufficient to bring some soul or souls to saving faith in Christ Lord cause men and women to think about their eternal Lord destiny heaven or hell may they repent of their sin today and may they come as sinners to Christ today and we pray Lord for thy people that you'll touch our hearts that you'll stir up our souls O God that we might realize what we're saved for we might realize the glorious purpose and Christ's redemption, even in our own hearts and lives, and that we will, Lord, gain ground again, that we'll repossess ground, that we'll possess our possessions. So to this end, Father, prepare every heart for the preaching of the word, create an highway in this house and through the internet for the preaching of the word of God. May it run today, may it have free course, may it be glorified in all of our hearts, and to this end, Almighty God, I pray that thou wouldst remember me, thy servant. I stand, Lord, as a candidate for the infilling of the spirit. I stand in human weakness. Lord, you know, oh God, the burden of my own heart. You know the desires of my own soul. Lord, you know how I feel. You know all about me. You know my down sitting and uprising and thoughts are far off. Lord, even though I'm poor and needy, yet the Lord thinketh upon me. Lord, I pray that you look down from heaven upon me, thy servant now, as I stand in this pulpit before this people. Lord, in need of thee, I cry unto heaven and I call upon the Lord today that thou would wash me from 
all my sin and grant to me the anointing of thy spirit, the infilling of the Holy Ghost for the preaching of the word of the living God. Father, in answer now to prayer, be pleased to fill me with thy spirit in wisdom and in power. And Father, in answer now to prayer, glorify thy dear Son and the people of God said, Amen. You know, Luke chapter 17 not only contains some words of Christ, but also one of his many parables. Uh, one of those parables that I'm sure there are very few sermons that have been preached on it. I'm not sure if you've ever heard a sermon, or a, a, a sermon on the parable of Luke chapter 17. But there's no parable, I believe, with more information and instruction about Christian service than the one we're going to consider here this afternoon. It's alive and bursting, I believe, with principles for service that are often ignored or else they are neglected and not preached on. I believe they're greatly needed in the church today. So therefore, uh, this is a very applicable message to God's people who are interested in Christian service in the church and outside of it. The Apostle Paul, whenever he wrote to the church at Corinth, had to remind them about their duty and had to command them and he had to teach them afresh. And he spoke to them about Christian service in this manner. And he says, I quote, What? Know ye not? That your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own, for ye are bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Writing to believers at Rome, he, he, he penned in those final chapters these remarkable words. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies as living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And even the parable that we have read, the Lord taught those who are serving the Master that at the end of, of life's day, we are to declare to the Lord that we're unprofitable servants. Another passage reminds us we are to beat our breast. And we're to cry, we're unprofitable servants. One of the reasons why you're not saved and immediately taken to heaven is that you're retained upon the earth for service. Why did the Lord save you and keep you on the earth? You say, well, because I have a wife and family. Or because I have plans and I have schooling and I was saved as a child and I had my whole life in front of me. Can I tell you something? That's not the reason why God saved you. The reason why God saved you and he has kept you alive and he has kept you on planet earth is that you are his witness. That you are his workers. You're his laborer. You're the individual that is salt and light in this world and he keeps his church and his people upon the earth that he might, that he might use them as channels and instruments in evangelism, as salt and light to shine into the darkness of this world as salty Christians to stand against the corruption of this world and to preserve righteousness in the earth. If the Lord was to remove the church, every single believer on planet earth right now from this earth and this world, this world would be consumed with fire. That's the reason why judgment hasn't come. It's because God's people are still on the earth and the Lord would not destroy even Sodom and Gomorrah if there were five righteous people all in that city and those cities of the plain. And the moment that the Lord took Lot out of Sodom and Gomorrah and we believe it was only Lot that was saved, immediately fire and brimstone came down upon the cities of the plain. And we believe Christ retains us as a church, as individual believers, to labor in his vineyard, to evangelize your friends and your family. We're not here to enjoy this world as such. We're not here to have all of this world's goods accumulated and in our bank balance and all property bought up. We're not here but to serve the Lord, to glorify God. And when your work is finished, when your work and my work is done, then the Lord takes us home. It's not some fatal disease or an accident that will do it. It's God's will when our work is finished, when it's up. When we are finished what the Lord intends for us to do, then he takes us home. And in 
C.H. Spurgeon would have told many people this, even his students, that you are to think of yourself as invincible until your work is finished. And when that work is done, when that work is over, I often you have heard people who have been ill and they've been raised to health again. And people who perhaps have come through some major surgery or some great accident. And they've often said this, you know the Lord has spurred me because he must have a purpose for me. He has kept me here because he must have a work for me to do. Can I tell you something? It doesn't take the Lord to deliver you from illness or an accident for you to know that. That is true right now. Whether you have been healthy all your life and never met with a single accident. The Lord has us here to be his witnesses, to evangelize, to serve, to honor, to glorify God. That's our chief end as we teach in our catechism. We're saved to be the salt and light of this corrupt and dark world so as to better the lives of others and to glorify God among the unconverted. Every true blood-washed, born-again Christian is saved For a life of full and devoted service to Jesus Christ their Lord and their Saviour. The parable before us today will help us better understand something more of Christian duty and our service for Jesus Christ our Lord while upon this earth. So I want you to think as we consider this parable now of the character of the Christian service. The character and the nature or the very essence of our work for Christ is beautifully presented here in the words of this parable. It's seen, the character of it is, seen in the diversity of our service. Notice what it says here in verses 7 and 8. Notice what it tells you there, verses 7 and 8. But which of you, having a servant plowing or feeding cattle, will say unto him by and by, when he has come from the field, go and sit down to meet. No, no. The master says you have more work to do. And will not rather say unto him, verse 8, make ready wherewith I may sup, and gird thyself and serve me, till I have eaten and drunken, and afterward thou shalt eat and drink. And so the character of Christian service is seen here in this parable. The diversity of our service is seen here. In the parable, the servant's duty very greatly. You could see that. And not everything's put in here, by the way. Now, I'm a townie trying to talk about farming here. But you would understand that there's a lot going in here. The Lord doesn't mention everything that this man did. He wasn't just plowing and feeding cattle. No doubt there was mixed farming. And there was agriculture as well, for he was planting as well as other things. And we know that. The master was eating and drinking the fruit of his own land. And the servant was working in his field. He was plowing. So that means he was cultivating the crops as well. And he was feeding cattle. And there was a diversity there. And when he came into the house, that wasn't enough. He also served his master's needs. He was in the kitchen. He was sweating over all the Uh, equipment in order to prepare a meal for his master even though he was tired even though he was weary from working in the field we know that he feeds cattle we know that he plows we know that he prepares and he serves meals for his master his mistress and even for the members of the family and for visitors and strangers who, who come and his work in the morning began maybe about four in the morning, finishing about three o'clock in the afternoon. And he's ready to rest, but then he has the tea to make, he's the dinner to make, and he's the service of the house to do as well. And there may be jobs outside that need done around the home. And so the servant is kept going from early morning till late in the evening. All these duties, and no doubt many more beside are mentioned, they're intended by Christ in this parable, to teach us something of the diversity of Christian service. We're not all called to be preachers. We're not all called to be missionaries on the mission field. We're not all called to be an elder or a deacon in the church. Not all of us are called to be Sunday school teachers or youth workers or youth leaders. We're not all called to sing We're not all called to testify. We understand that. But there is a diversity of service in the church. And the Lord is highlighting for us now the faithfulness of the servant. That whatever he can do, he does it. Here's an all-rounder. That's what we're looking at. 
It's not a picture of every believer. Not every believer is an all-rounder. But this individual is. Because he's representing the entire body of believers. That's why he's an all-rounder. Because he represents the church. He represents you and he represents me. He's not only plowing. He can do that. He's also sowing. He can do that. He's also harvesting. He can do that. He's also feeding cattle. He can do that. And no doubt bringing cattle into the world. And sheep during the lambing season, etc., etc. He's doing all that. And when he gets into the house, you would imagine the farmer comes into the house and the tea's on the table. I don't think there are too many farmers in this congregation. I have to be careful here. I could start a row this afternoon. <laughs> but when they come in, the wife's sitting with her feet up with a fire on and she's watching her favorite TV program. And the spuds are still black. They have to be washed and peeled and boiled. And the farmer's slaving. I would suggest when they come into the house, it's on the table. But not so here because I told you it's a, a parable on service. It's the church. It's not just an individual, but it's the church. He comes in in the evening and his work's not done. And this man now can cook. Maybe it's a lady working in the field, feeding cattle. Maybe it's a lady in the field and plowing and sowing and reaping, coming in. Either way, it doesn't matter because it's a picture of the church and the diversity of its service. It's not just that everybody's an all-rounder. I can plow, sow, feed cattle. I can cook. I can be dead domesticated. I can do anything you want. I'm your man. And there's no one like me. No, it's not. This is a diversity. This is all believers and all that they're doing. It's literally the work of the church collectively, not invested in an individual, but collectively plowing, feeding cattle, then coming into the house and preparing the meals and cleaning, tidying and doing whatever they can, whatever their hand finds to do. They do it. Whatever's needed to be done, it's done. There's a diversity here. In other words, all of these duties, as we read and understand the parable aright, it means that we must be willing to do whatever the Lord would ask of us. And if we don't have personnel uh, to be missionaries, there are others in the congregation who will respond. If we don't have people who will go to the Whitfield College, young men or women or even older people, we will have some, not all. Some will go and ply. Some will feed cattle. Some will uh, cultivate the ground. Some will work in the kitchen, so to speak. And if you cannot ply, then you must sow. And if you cannot sow, then you must prepare meals for the master. Now let's translate that into Christian service because that's how it's meant to be. It's not talking that we all must become farmers. If that is the case, this is the only command I'll have to disobey. But it's telling us Translate the parable from the farm and the servant and the master and bring it into the church. Translate it into the language of the church. And here's what it's saying. In the context of Christian service, this is what Christ's saying to us. We must do what we can. We must look at the work of God. And ask ourselves this question. Take a good look at the church. Take a good look at the work of God. Take a good look around you. Have a look at yourself today. And ask you yourself this question. What can I do? That's what the parable is all about. Plowing, sowing, cultivating, harvesting, feeding, looking after, preparing, working, serving. Doing whatever the hand finds to do, whether it's in the field or in the house. It's the collective work of the church. And you and I are in here somewhere among those that are mentioned in the parable. We need to ask ourselves, what can I do in this church? What can I do? What can I do in this church? What steps can I take to follow the Lord, obey the Lord? We've already outlined that in baptism. That's obedience. In membership, we bring in six new members today. Maybe you could drive the bus. 
There's only certain people who are allowed to drive the buses today because of the change in the law. Those that have a certain uh, driving license. And so there's always a need for people to help. Maybe you say, well, I don't have the driving license, but could you give maybe once a month to sit on the bus, to go out with the children's work, youth, or whatever other meeting that we need the bus for? Surely there's something you could do. Plowing, sowing, feeding cattle, service in the kitchen, so on and so on. You can see what the Lord's teaching us here. It's every conceivable work you could think of in the church that's really covered in the parable. And maybe you could help with the media team. And maybe you could distribute CDs and DVDs. There, there's many things you could do. Maybe you could help in the children's meeting. You'll not be asked to take the story. You'll not be asked to stand at the front and lead the choruses. You'll not be asked to do a memory verse. Well, not in the first week, maybe the second. You'll not be pushed to the front and say, well, you must do this. You're in here now. No, no, don't be put off by those things. But you could sit there. You could enjoy those meetings. You could sit among the children to uh, keep discipline. You could travel on the bus. You could bring children with you. What can I do? That's what the parable is saying. What can I do in this church? What can I do for the Lord in this vineyard? Uh, maybe you could help with the young people. You could help with the outreach. We commence, God willing, our open airs. You can attend them. You can stand in the public domain in your town with people that you know. And stand publicly for Christ. You'll not be asked to testify. You'll not be asked to take the microphone. Uh, you can just join with us to sing. You could actually go around the doors with others. As we're preaching the gospel. And we're testifying and we're singing. Uh, the group around the microphone. And others will go around the district. They'll give out gospel literature. Surely you could do that. What about the security in the car park? There's a list there. I'm not sure if the list is filled up or not. It might be. But I'm sure uh, that the more the better. And that means less duties for others and to share the load. To share, you could come on a Sunday morning and by the way, you can sit in the car park. You can put on your phone. You can, you can even have the use of our free Wi-Fi. All right, you can use the Wi-Fi in the car park and you can even watch the service. But you've got to watch the cars as well, by the way. Uh, no sleeping. <laughs> Surely you could pray and come to the prayer meetings and even if it doesn't suit you every week, you could come to a Sunday morning or a Sunday evening. If it doesn't suit on a Tuesday night or a Friday night, I'm sure whatever does suit. Or maybe you say, well, look, I could get once a fortnight. Well, that's a start. And that's better than no times at all. And maybe you could share your testimony. Maybe you could indicate, I'd like to do that. I had a text message from our sister Yvonne Spence. And Yvonne is mad keen to share her testimony. And we've already the date set. And at the end of June, in the will of the Lord, uh, she'll be here. Uh, she feels strongly that this is something she must do. She must do for the Lord. And she wants to do it. And so there is, we will accommodate those who are willing to serve in this house. Maybe you could help in some practical ways. See the diversity of the service. Maybe you haven't joined some of the supper teams. We're back, by the way, to the supper. Uh, we're doing light refreshments on our family nights and other occasions. And maybe you haven't joined the supper teams yet and you could put your name down. Uh, you don't have to serve uh, all the tables. You may not uh, be able to uh, make sandwiches or anything like that, but you could come, you can take tables away, you can serve tea, you can do something and help in so many practical ways. Uh, I'm sure you could help in the seniors meeting if you were retired or if you're off on a Friday, uh, that monthly meeting. We always are looking for workers and help there. Uh, what can I do for the Lord? the diversity of the Christian service, seen in the character of Christian service here. Can I think as well under that heading, the character of Christian service, of the duration of our service? Notice what it says there in verses 7 and 8. Uh, it's a real key feature of this parable. Verse 7, which of you, having a servant, and look what he does, he starts early in the morning, he's plowing, feeding, and then when he comes in, the master doesn't even say, look, you need a rest, go and sit down and get yourself something to eat. But no, verse 8, will not rather say unto him, make ready wherewith I may sup, gird thyself, serve me till I have eaten and drunken. And then afterward, after your little day's work, then you can sit down and rest and take refreshment. One of the key features of this parable is the long hours that the servant puts in for the master. And there are many people in this congregation and in my old congregation in Lisburn and they understand the nature 
of long hours working. They understand it. And if some who work for themselves were to get paid by the hour, they might be on about three or four pound an hour. Well, that's what they tell us anyway. They might be on more. But I will say this to you. Verse 7, working hard all day. Verse 8, he comes into the house and what? He has more work to do. It seems there's no end to the work. For he gets up in the morning till he's about to lay his head to rest. And even then, there's more work to be done. Now you can see not only the diversity of that work, but the duration of it. That's the character of Christian service. I want to tell you something. What the Lord's intimating here and what he's teaching here and instructing us is, it's talking about life's day of service. From the day you're saved to the day you're taken home to be with the Lord or the Lord returns. That's exactly the duration of Christian service. I want to tell you something. There's no saying to the Lord, that's me, I'm done, I'm finished. I'm fully retired from the Lord's work. Now we can move from one work to another. We can move from one position to another position. We can step back and allow someone else in. And I think that's a healthy thing. I think that's a very good thing. That's a healthy thing. So we're not against that. And sometimes folks have to take a step back. Sometimes younger men come in. We understand that. But that doesn't mean those other people are not in service. Far from it. And when you retire in the Lord's work, it's R-E-T-Y-R-E-D. Retired. New trades. You're doing something else. And that's exactly how we see it. And we know that sometimes it's a work is for a younger man. We understand that. And I have to face that at some stage here in the near future. I have to understand uh, that it is perhaps for a younger man as well. But it doesn't mean if I stop preaching and retired from pulpit ministry that ministry's over. No, a new service has begun. I enter in from the field to the house. And I begin to do this service instead of the one I was doing. So you can see that the duration of Christian service is, it's never ending. It goes on and on and on and on. And maybe with or without us. Surely this speaks to us concerning the length of Christian service. From the earliest days that we were saved, until the night of death settles upon the soul and the physical frame, we're to be employed in Christ's glad service. Our service lasts until the Lord calls us home or he returns personally to take us to heaven. So there's no quitting. There can be no stopping. We need to keep going. We need to continue to serve. And we need to be steadfast and unmovable. Always abounding in the work of the Lord. In the character of Christian service, we see not only the diversity and the duration, but I believe the character is seen in the difficulty of our service. Notice what it says here. Plowing or feeding cattle. Now, I'm no farmer. But I have seen the machinery that farmers have today. And farmers from my Lisburn days till now, and even when I go down into the west of the band to family and friends and others down there, they take great delight to bring a townie into the farmyard and show them all this equipment. Massive machinery. i never forget looking at a combine harvester. And I would need a set of ladders to get into the, the very uh, driving uh, box of it. I couldn't believe the size of it. It's massive, absolutely massive. A man who does contract uh, grass cutting and silage, whatever it is. But I, I would imagine in, the, in Bible times, plowing and feeding cattle would be hard work. There's no modern machinery in those days. No real up-to-date tools to do the job. Most of it was done manually. They used the power of the animal and the human muscle, and most of those farmers died young. Their body could not stick working and tilling that land. And the ground hard and the rocks, cultivating it, the dry climate, having to irrigate. There was no irrigation as such. Carrying water, doing different things. You can imagine how difficult it would be. And the Lord's not talking, and I'm not saying that it's easy to farm today. So don't, please, don't take offense. I'm not saying that. But you do have the machinery. And you can do things better today than they could in these days. 
And you can do things quicker than they can in Bible times, or they could in Bible times. Christ would have us all know, and have no doubt about this, that what is necessary for Christian service is discipline and hard work. It's not easy to serve the Lord. That's what the Lord's saying. And don't be deceived or don't be fooled into thinking that Christian service is like a bed of roses. And we enter into Christian service, wow, it's great. You'll meet with problems. You'll meet with difficulties. There'll be hindrances. There'll be discouragements. Uh, listen, there'll be setbacks. And when you plow, you're not always guaranteed the harvest. And I want to tell you, hard work is involved in Christian service. And there'll never be a harvest for good if we don't labor for the master from dawn till setting sun. We could quit too early and lose the harvest of the good. Let me hurry on. The character of, Christian, of the Christian service. I want you to think in this parable of the centrality of the Christian service. You notice there in verses 7 and 8, and we'll not read them all again, even though the servant has worked hard all day long, at the various jobs that he's been given to do, yet when he gets into the house, you'd imagine that's the time for to give this man a rest. You'd imagine that's the time when he would serve his own purpose and look after his own need. And he would wash. And he would feed. And then he would settle down with his wife and his children, enjoy a cool evening, sitting out on the veranda, watching the children play, and just enjoying the sunshine in the evening. But not so. He no sooner in. He doesn't maybe get time even to wash himself except for his hands. And he begins then to prepare the meal and the food for his master and his master's wife and their family. And then their friends that have gathered and maybe some neighbors as well. And maybe some other people who are rich who have gathered into that home. And it seems that this man now thinks of no one but his master. He sets aside his own needs. And he sets aside his own desires. He sets aside that which is necessary for himself. In order to serve his master. And the Lord even said in the parable. He says. Do you think the master would thank him for that? No. It's expected of him. It's his duty. And the Lord spoke about that humility in service when he said, after you've finished and you've done the plowing and the feeding and you've done the harvest and you've done the cleaning and the cooking, after you've done it all, then remember, you're an unprofitable servant. It's your duty. You haven't done anything over and above what was actually expected. And oft times we, we do something for the Lord. And we think somehow the Lord is so bettered by it. And some people we know, some people feel, well, I did this for the Lord. You know, maybe they've never given money to the Lord's work in a long time. And then five, six, ten years down the line, they give a hundred pound and they say, wow, I'm some guy. I just give a hundred pound. Wouldn't be too many give a hundred pound a day. That's how they feel. And there's others who never come to church, never come to meetings, and 10 years down the road they come to church, and as if, wow, I've done God a favor. 10 years ago I was at church, but here I am today. I don't think there were too many people like me not going to church for 10 years, and I've come today. I want to tell you something. If you go to church and you never miss a meeting, and you never miss a prayer meeting, and you never miss a children's meeting, or a youth meeting, or an outreach meeting, or a late night prayer meeting, and you never miss a prayer meeting on the Lord's Day, and you never miss a single special meeting in this house, I want to tell you something. Bow your head, and beat your breast, and acknowledge that you're an unprofitable servant, because we've only done what's been expected. And if you add on to that, and you throw in more into that, and if life's little day's work is not enough, that you pour more in, and you take your Saturday, which you could have had off with your family, and you went and did outreach, and you went down to County Cavan, and you served the Lord, and you give out 5,000 gospel invitations to the homes in the Consider Christ campaign yesterday, I want to tell you something. You bow your heart and your head, because the Master's glory... And his service comes first. There's the centrality. Now, I want to tell you something. You do not hear that kind of preaching today. 
on Christian duty. You'll not get a pat on the back at the door on the way out when you preach Christian duty. You'll not. And no minister should expect that, no matter what he preaches on. But Christ is teaching us the priority that Christian service must take in your life and mine. The centrality of the Christian's labor for the master. Everything that we are and have must be set aside. That's hard to do. We're naturally selfish. And if we're honest, we'd have to say this and I'll start it off. I'm the most selfish person in the world. I think of nobody but me. That is true of us all. And yet here the centrality of what Christ is teaching in service. Any wonder there was over a thousand people walked away from the Lord when he spoke about the discipline of Christian service in John chapter 6. Over a thousand. You say, well, the scripture doesn't say that. I know, but it's implied. The Lord fed 5,000 men. And that same crowd followed him. And when he preached the sermon in John chapter 6, you should read the sermon. It says a thousand men walked away. Women and children with him. So the Lord in one sermon lost about maybe three to 4,000 people. Why should a preacher get discouraged when he loses two? The Lord lost two and a half to 3,000 people in one sermon. And they even said this. <laughs> That's a hard thing. Who could take that? Who could live that kind of life? Who would want that kind of discipline? All for Christ and little for me. But that's not the truth because the parable doesn't finish there, as you know. Uh, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. All these things shall be added unto you. I I want to say something to you. Uh, That servant, when he comes into the house to serve, you notice what it says in verse 8. It says, And will not rather say unto him, Make ready wherewith I may sup. And look at those words, And gird thyself. Gird thyself. Do you know what that means? Those long garments that they wore, they were literally to roll them up. And they were to put a belt around them, around their waist. And in many ways, they were literally rolled up to the waist. And a big belt was put around them. So that those garments wouldn't get in the way of service in the house. They wouldn't trip. They wouldn't be hindered. If they tripped and fell, they couldn't serve. They would be individuals that would be laid aside. They could Break an arm, break a leg. They could smash their head open if they fell and tripped on those garments. So gird thyself. That is, take everything and remove it from you that stands in your way of serving me. That's exactly what the Lord's saying here. Gird thyself. Gather up those garments. Tie them so they don't get in the way. So nothing and no one must come before Christ and his glad service. Seek ye first. The kingdom of God. And his righteousness on all these things shall be added unto you. Thirdly and finally, you have in this parable, the Lord teaches the compensation for the Christian service. Notice what it says in verse 8. And afterward, thou shalt eat and drink. And so, while we may serve Christ and put him first, may we may discipline ourselves and deny our own needs. The Lord will not be unmindful of us. You may not be rewarded this Scene of time. But you will have eternal reward. You will have treasure in heaven. You will never labor in vain. And don't say for a moment as a Sunday school teacher. I never see a child saved you know. I never see any influence that I make. Through their catechism and memory verse. And the stories that I bring. And the prayers that I pray. And their names that are mentioned. I never seem to get any fruit for my labor. What's the use in any way? Some of them don't even appear for the class. And I'm so discouraged and disheartened. I want to tell you something. It says afterward. Afterward. Thou shalt eat and drink. In other words. You'll have eternal refreshment. And you'll have eternal rest. And you'll be blessed. For what you've done for the Lord. Did you know this? Did you know this child of God? Are you listening to me? Look at me. Did you know this? There are different degrees of glory in heaven. Did you know that? Different degrees of glory in heaven. And it's all to do with service on the earth. Could you better heaven? Yes. 
Yes, you can. Surely where Christ is, heaven's there. There are different degrees of glory in heaven. Just as there are different degrees of torment in hell. The Bible tells us that. And I, I do believe there are those who enter heaven by the skin of their teeth. Saved by grace alone. They're there. But they're empty handed. Nothing to give. Not a single crown. One in service to lay at the feet of the master. Now I have no doubt. I want you to quote me in this. I want to take you to heaven for a moment. The Lord's come back. We're all in heaven. Those of us are born again and saved. And guess what? There's a row. I can see them. There they are. And they're all free Presbyterian ministers. And they're all at the front. Waiting on all this reward and compensation. And the Lord tells them all. Myself included. Could you men just step to the back? What? This to here? No further? You sure? A wee bit further. 14 billion people later. About here. Yes, that will do. I want to tell you all these individuals that are unknown in the church step forward. And they have given a life of service to Christ. No one knew about it. But afterward, afterward, they were blessed. I want to take you, as I finish this message today, to heaven itself and show you how the thing is, this parable is completely reversed. Completely reversed. In order to do that, I want you to turn back in your Bible, and we'll finish here, to Luke chapter 12, and I want you to read with me verse 35. Luke chapter 12, and this is in the light of the second coming of Christ and the end of Christian service. Now look what it says in verse 35. And let your loins be girded about and your lights burning. That's your life of service. And ye yourselves like unto men that wait for their Lord, serve until he come. When he will return from the wedding, that when he cometh and knocketh, they may open unto him immediately. Now look what it says. Blessed are those servants whom the Lord when he cometh shall find watching. Verily I say unto you. Now remember in the parable in Luke 17, the servant girds himself. Wraps up his garments and serves his master. But now the Lord becomes the servant. As as if you're the master. Look at verse 37. Blessed are those servants whom the Lord when he cometh shall find watching. Verily I say unto you. That is he, Christ, shall gird himself. And he'll make them to sit down to meet. And will come forth and serve them. Isn't that remarkable? The Lord girds up his garments. Nothing gets in the way of looking after you in heaven. And he takes the servant's place. And he comes and he prepares meat, refreshment for you. Isn't that amazing? The master girds himself now. You've done that all your life. And the Lord says, I'll compensate you for that. Let me gird my garments up. Let nothing come in the way or stop me doing this for you. Let me now serve you. Let me give you more than you've ever given to me. And I could labor the point, but I'm not going to. But there is a reward for serving the Lord. It's a reward of grace, not of works. We, we don't deserve it. Even when we've done a reasonable service, that's what the Lord said in Luke 17, 10. We're unprofitable servants. We don't deserve it. It's not a reward of works. It's a sheer reward of grace. That the Lord would even recompense us and reward us for doing that which is expected. That which is commanded. That which is our reasonable service. Yet he says, I'll gird myself. I'll prepare the meal this time. And just you sit down. And take your ease and your rest eternally. And now, let me serve you. Now it's not too much to ask on earth. That a little speck of eternity. That's a tiny, tiny piece of dust. You could hardly see it under a microscope. 
That's all you're talking about for service. That tiny, tiny little speck you couldn't even see with a human eye. That's all it is in the little dot on eternity. And the Lord says, just serve me for that little time and put me first. Deny yourself and follow me. And then, wow, for all eternity, I'll gird myself. Take everything out of the way that would hinder me serving you. I'll prepare meat and I'll serve you. That remarkable thing. Why would he even do that for us? Because it's the reward of grace. Infinite, marvelous, matchless grace. And oh, for grace to serve the Lord. Therefore, my beloved brethren, Paul said, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as ye know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. Let's turn to our hymn books. We'll finish with the hymn 515. Is your life a channel of blessing? Is the love of God flowing through you? After the singing of the first verse, I'll go to the door. Uh, those who have to leave uh, can do so. And those who are remaining for communion, please just remain in your seats, whether upstairs or down. And the elders will serve you the elements. And uh, we'll have the communion feast together. We're in bringing in six new members today. And we rejoice in that. We trust the Lord will bless them as they join us in fellowship and around the table of the Lord. Let's stand after the key as we worship, please.